Hi, Paula. Thanks so much for joining us here today at The Social Marketplace. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. We really appreciate the, the time because we want to make sure that people in Australia get a real sense of what's happening around the world. And we're moving our way through continent by continent over the two days. So obviously, we want to talk to you about what's going on in the US, but to also understand that you have a global view yeah. and that you can share some insights about that global picture for us as well. Sounds great. But I suppose my first question is, what drew you into impact investing in the first place? I spent the better part of my 20s and early 30s uh, working in emerging markets with various enterprises. So I was in post-war Bosnia working on regenerating micro-industries and villages and cities that were devastated by the war. I spent a year in rural India working with a for-profit, socially driven private school that was working in partnership with the government to try to deliver high quality education to poor students. The point of this being, I was captured by the power of using market-based techniques to try to deliver social goods and services. And what do you think sparked interest in the U.S. in general? Why did the U.S. consider taking up these opportunities? Well, while the term impact investing is relatively new, it's less than 10 years old, uh, impact investing itself is not new. So in the U.S. it goes back at least um, several decades. We just didn't call it impact investing, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And now we do, and we sort of have this unified umbrella to talk about a whole range of sectors from affordable housing to education to financial inclusion. Um, And I think people are looking at this and seeing this is a moment where, look, we we have severe budget constraints, the complexity of our problems are growing. We have no excuse for leaving willing talent and capital on the sidelines. And so this is a unique moment where we can bring some of these resources to bear. How do you think the U.S. market is characterized? How does it differ in the way that it's grown and what it looks like now compared to other places around the world? So I think there is definitely a grounding mechanism around um, a belief in the power of entrepreneurship, Mm. a driving force around that. And so I think there is a much greater emphasis, I would say, on um, private sector-led innovation or private sector partnerships with government or whatnot as an area of innovation and Mm. emphasis. There is also, interestingly, a very strong emphasis within the United States and within impact investing in the United States in um, international development. You know, and that's a lot of what Omidy, our network does is invest in emerging markets and enterprises that can reach um, relatively disadvantaged populations and bring them, bring opportunity to these populations. So Paula, what organizations do you think have been really important to catalyze the growth of the market in the US? We have to mention, of course, Rockefeller Foundation, which has played a critical role in helping even come up with the term impact investing and funding a whole range of infrastructure for the field. Um, A number of players who have helped uh, with affordable housing, with community development. Um, And then I would say OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, has been doing impact investing arguably for decades. The list goes on and on. It's sort of, it's important for me to say it's impossible for me to answer that question mm. without leaving out some really important players because it's a movement and there are quite a few incredibly important players that are coalesced around this in various sectors. Paula, can you tell me a bit more about the work of Omidia and how, how that catalyzes change around the globe? So Omidia Network was founded about 10 years ago by Pierre Omidia, who started eBay, Um, And with this fundamental belief in the power of individuals to make a difference and wanting to create opportunity for those that don't have access, we do both for-profit and non-profit investing. Um, We've done about $700 million of investing thus far. And, um, you know, in areas as diverse as education, financial inclusion, property rights. And what do you think Australia can learn? Because we are a bit behind you in the US. What do you think we can learn from the way the market's grown in the US? So first of all, I I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in Australia. Um, You know, two things that that I've been reflecting on lately as even lessons for us. One is um, policy matters greatly. And that's part of why I'm so excited about the work of the G7, G8 (laughs) task force. Favorable policy and sensible regulation 
makes all the difference between a market that takes off and that doesn't. Um, and so, you know, we need to repeat that lesson here. And, and so I'm very optimistic about the ability of the task force and all of the national advisory boards associated with it to really activate very important partnerships with governments. So I would also say, you know, one of the places, at least from Omidyar Network's perspective, that we're seeing great big bottleneck is around early stage risk capital. Tell me about, about your involvement with the G8 or the G7, I never know what to call it now. So Matt Benick, who's our managing partner at Omidyar Network, is the U.S. private sector representative to the G7, G8 task <laughs> on social impact investing. So we've been very deeply involved in those discussions. And then um, we've also been running the U.S. National Advisory Board to the effort. And so that's actually been a very extensive effort to unify leaders in the U.S. uh, around a national policy platform for impact investing. Um, So we're quite excited about that. And why do you think the task force is important globally? Impact investing is a big deal. It's a big deal because we do not have enough funds in philanthropy or frankly, even in government to solve the complex problems that we face globally. Um, And this is one additional source of capital that can be applied to some of these problems. It also represents, I think, a new way of thinking, a fresh approach that can also complement some of our existing approaches. So it seems as if most of the countries in the, the G8, G7, were doing something anyway, but what happens when they start meeting on a monthly basis? What shifts? So the U.S. has had some really great innovations over the past few decades in impact investing that we've been sharing with the task force and equally learning from some of the great stuff, for example, happening in the U.K. right now around tax treatment for social enterprises and investing around um, big society capital and unclaimed assets. There's just a lot of rich dialogue and discussion, and I think what's sharing these best practices is what's leading to some very productive recommendations about how to move the field forward. In your opinion, what's the most exciting one or two things that are happening in this market globally today? So you kind of stumped me with this one because there's so much going on, really a tremendous amount of activity, and isolating what's most important is a difficult call. Uh, Let me tell you about two things I'm really excited about. Um, Number one, I'm really excited about some of the efforts by governments to think about early stage funding in emerging markets. The second thing I would also say from our perspective at Omidyar Network as an investor is what's going on at the entrepreneurial level, right? There are people that are actually tackling these problems on the ground. One area that we're really excited about within the general financial inclusion umbrella is mobile payments. Think about the massive opportunity here. The amount of difference that this can make, we're talking about billions of dollars of difference that can get hand, you know, directly in the hands of the poor um, through a whole series of commercial innovations that are taking place um, and that we're excited to be funding some of these startups. Um, So I guess I use that example both because we're excited about that in its own right, but also because we're excited about the amount of dynamism that is being applied to some of these big problems. And I love it how they just leapt right over the existing infrastructure, straight into the future. It wasn't about catching up to what the rest of the world has. They just leapt right over the top, straight into what will be. is very exciting. So where do you think this market will be in the future? Where can this go? Ten years from now... I think we're going to have a much more mature market where people understand that if you're investing in a specific circumstance, e.g. you're investing in a country that's not prosperous, you're trying to reach um, very poor people, your returns expectations should be of a certain range. Whereas if you're investing in urban New York, you might have a different set of expectations. I think refining that set of kind of comparing, being able to say this is an apple and this is an orange and this is a pear Mm. um, is going to be critical to the development of the field and that's exactly where I see us going. It's very exciting. I agree. So thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'm sure everyone really enjoy hearing your your perspectives out of the US but also globally. So thank you very much. Pleasure, yeah, thanks for having me.